So, let's keep going on uh, what we were saying uh, yesterday. So we finished the proof, not without a little bit of trouble, but we finished the proof of the simon lieb inequality. And now I want to reinterpret it, to give you another interpretation of the proof, which I think is going to be enlightening. But I first wanted to do it in a most elementary way. And, um, so the idea is that, in fact, this high temperature expansion, it gives rise to some kind of random walk uh, explanation, interpretation of the spin-spin correlations. So remember that we had this path gamma. So for any omega, we had a gamma of omega, which was a kind of a backbone, like an exploration of the path from 0 to x in my, uh, in my uh, omega. So this allowed us to rewrite this quantity as a sum of a gamma from 0 to x, gamma included in, in uh, g. And here we had a certain thing. We had t to the gamma. And then we had the sum of a sourceless current, but omega included in g minus this gamma bar that we defined yesterday divided by the sum for omega included in, of, included in g of t to the gamma. Well, this whole thing depends only on gamma, right? So I can decide that this will be the weight of my walk gamma from 0 to x. So I defined it to be the weight Let's call it rho, because usually it's called rho. Rho g of gamma. So when we reinterpret it like that, what do we end up with? We end up with the spin-spin correlations is equal to the sum of every possible gamma from 0 to x, gamma included in g, of rho g of gamma. Think even like here, gamma could be whatever you want. It's just it has a weight, which is this if gamma is edge avoiding and blah, blah, and going from 0 to x. And for instance, 0 if it's not edge avoiding or things like that. But this, you see, should make you think to another quantity, which is quite famous, which is the green function. If you look at the green function in G between 0 and x, well, this is just the sum over every pass from 0 to x, pass staying in g, of, so let's say that we are uh, 1 over degree of g, or let's say 1 over, let, let's say we are on zd. Like so g is a subset of zd. 1 over 2d to the length. Right? This is a green function. You sum over every pass. And you look at the, probab I mean, the probability of this given path. There is no constraint on the length, no constraint on anything. And this gives you the green function, the expected number of visits of a simple random walk to x when it starts from 0. So you see here a clear analogy. The spin-spin correlations are, in some sense, the re expressed as the green function for a certain very non-Markovian and very non-simple uh, random walk, random pass. OK? So when you do like that, you can read again what we did in our, um, in our um, proof of the simon lieb inequality. And you will notice that we use basically two things. The first thing that we use is that if I look at the weight of a path, which is a concatenation of two paths, gamma 1 and then gamma 2, we use that this was, in fact, rho g of gamma 1 times rho in g minus gamma, gamma 1 bar of gamma 2. We use that. That's exactly what we did. You remember you had the. You, you express this as t of gamma 1 union gamma 2. And then here, we just make appear the sum where you get g minus gamma 1 bar. You make it appear at the top and bottom. And what you end up with when you use this notation is exactly this thing. 
And notice that this thing is completely straightforward when you look at the green function, right? This is, I mean, for simple random walk, it's just the multiplicativity of this thing. Okay? That was the first item we used. And the second item, and there, when you write it like that, you immediately see that condition on gamma 1, when you sum on gamma 2, you get the spin spin correlation in g minus gamma 1 bar. Right? You sum over every gamma 2, that gives you exactly here with g minus gamma 1 bar, it gives you exactly the same formula. The second thing that we use is that rho g of gamma is smaller or equal to rho s of gamma for every pass included in s. So if gamma is included in s, in fact, changing the underlying graph from g to s increases the weight. OK? And this, again, is trivial in this case, simply because they are still, true, they are still equal. So what do you end up, by the way, here? Since these properties are also satisfied by the green function, by a simple random walk, what you could also have said, and this is a thing which is exactly following the same proof, is that the green function is smaller than the sum over y on the boundary of s of g s 0 y g g y x. So another analogy, so I told you the Simon Lieb is looking like this inequality for Bernoulli percolation. Maybe an inequality which is even closer in some, in some sense is this trivial inequality on uh, the simple random walk. OK? So here, by the way, these things, when you think about them, they are kind of telling you that the, this, this process, which is non-Markovian, has properties that are similar to the self avoiding walk, in fact. And this is something that we will not use in this class, but which were very useful to derive, for instance, less expansion for the easing model. Is this analogy between this thing and self avoiding walk? OK. Good. So from there, so this was just a parenthesis to say, that, I mean, to give you another interpretation of the proof. Now let's try to get an important application of, of the simon lieb inequality, which was a proposition that I very briefly mentioned, I mean, that I gave you as an exercise and then realized I forgot to give you a hint, which made the exercise kind of difficult, I think. So it's the following that if chi of beta, uh, which is equal by definition to the sum over x of sigma 0, sigma x beta. So let's be in infinite volume. Let's not bother about that. Then there exists a constant, which definitely depends on beta, such that sigma 0, sigma x beta is smaller than exponential of minus c times x for every x. That's the first thing. And uh, also, chi of beta c equal plus infinity. So more than the result itself, somebody came yesterday. Yes? So the, the first one is too much. Sorry? You assume that the sum is fine. Ah, OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> of course. Yes, thank you. So yesterday, came somebody, somebody came to me and said, OK, uh, are you going to use that to prove exponential decay? In the sense, are you going to prove that the susceptibility is finite and then deduce from this proposition that you have exponential decay? when beta is smaller than beta c. Um, it's not quite what we are going to do. It's more the proof which is going to be important and that we are going to use. So remember the proof more than the statement. So how does the proof go? <coughs> In fact, 
we are going to prove something stronger. We are going to say, assume, assume that there exists a S containing 0 and being finite, such that phi beta of s, which I'm going to give a definition to that. This is going to be, by definition, the sum for y on the boundary of s of sigma 0, sigma y, s beta. If you think about it, when you remember the the Simon-Lieb inequality is just this part of the Simon-Lieb inequality when you forget the second part, okay? So this quantity is smaller than 1. Assume that there is a value for which this is strictly smaller than 1. Then I claim that you have exponential decay. So let us prove that there exists C such that this is true. Let's first prove that before explaining how you use it. But notice that if the susceptibility is finite, then by taking S to be a sufficiently large ball, the sum of the spin-spin correlation on the boundary will be finite, uh, will be smaller than 1, and we will deduce the phi beta of S is finite. But let's do that after. Let's first prove this thing. OK. So first, maybe a remark, because I could have done it maybe before, is that the Simon-Lieb inequality was stated in finite volume, right, with a graph G. But by letting G go to infinity, you end up, so Simon-Lieb inequality gives you that sigma 0, sigma x beta is smaller than the sum for y on the boundary of sigma 0, sigma y, s beta, sigma y, sigma x beta. Huh? So you should not be afraid of the fact that we are going to work in infinite volume here. This is really equivalent. OK. So here, what we are going to do is define m s of beta to be the infimum over every uh, x, which is not in lambda s, okay, of sigma 0, sigma x, beta, okay? So it's just the largest, uh, sorry, the largest, super, just the largest spin-spin correlation for points which are sufficiently far from the origin. Sorry? What's lambda s? Uh, lambda s is a box of size uh, s. Yeah, you, maybe, maybe you want me to put n it's, uh, to be more correct. Lambda n was a ball of size n, and will always be the ball of size n. I will not change it. OK. OK, so uh, by the way, s, since it's finite, let's say that s is included in lambda k. OK? k is fixed. So. OK, let's take, so fix x, which is not in lambda uh, n times k, OK? And observe that by, here I have lambda k, and inside I have my set s. By the Simon-Lieb inequality, I have that sigma 0 sigma x beta is smaller or equal to the sum for y on the boundary of sigma 0 sigma y s beta times sigma y sigma x beta. But notice that here, the distance between y and x is necessarily larger or equal 
Well, it's larger or equal to n minus 1 times k. Y is at distance k from the origin at most. So here, the distance between y and x is at least n minus 1 times k. OK. So I'm going to do something that I just realized now I didn't prove yet, but I'm going to prove it just after. But this is invariant other translation, this uh, state. So in particular, here, you did use that this is equal to sigma 0, sigma y minus x. So in particular, if y minus x is larger or equal to n minus 1k, this whole thing here is smaller or equal to m of n minus 1k of beta. Okay? But if now you have a uniform bound on this, what you immediately deduce is that this thing you can bound by phi beta of s times this uniform bound. OK. By maximizing on x, what you end up with is that m of nk of beta is smaller we call to phi beta of s m of n minus 1k of beta. So I obtain an inequality between m of nk and m of n minus 1k. From that, I did use immediately just by iterating that m of nk of beta is smaller or equal to phi beta of s to the n. But phi beta of s is strictly smaller than 1. So that immediately gives me that uh, the exponential decay I was looking for. If really, really you want to do it in a, like a more brutal, I mean, not using the invariance under translation because you don't trust that I will be able to prove it, then you can just define here the supremum over x and y, which are distance uh, n of each other. But it's really a little bit uh, useless. OK, so from that, I get that for every x, which is not in lambda nk, sigma 0, sigma x beta is smaller than exponential, I mean, that phi beta of s to uh, the n, which this implies immediately that for every x, sigma 0, sigma x beta is smaller than exponential, I mean, phi beta of s to the x divided by k. <coughs> and that gives us what we want. OK? So that was the first part of the proof. How do we deduce now the two things that we want? So first thing that we are going to deduce is that if the susceptibility is finite, then there exists an n such that sum for x on the boundary of lambda n of sigma 0, sigma x, beta is smaller strictly than 1. Right? This is clear because the sum of this thing is finite. But now notice that here, this is the spin-spin correlation on zd. But therefore, they are larger than the spin-spin correlation on lambda n by monotonicity in the graph of the spin-spin correlation. So this is larger or equal to the sum for x on the boundary of lambda n of sigma 0, sigma x, lambda n beta. And this is phi beta of lambda n. So what I just proved here is that if the susceptibility is finite, then one of the phi beta of s is finite. And that implies the result. OK? So how do we prove now the second part of the claim, which was that the susceptibility at beta c is infinite? And notice, by the way, at this stage, in fact, we only use 
the Simon Lieb inequality, uh, the Simon inequality. Here, if we would have just this, that would be completely fine. There would be no problem with it. Here, you would just use phi beta of lambda n. You would just define it without the s, and it will work. For what I'm going to do now, it's not going to be the same. Because now what I'm going to say is the following. So let us prove that phi beta c of s is larger or equal to 1 for every s. OK? So how do you prove that? Well, you go by contradiction. If phi beta c of s is strictly smaller than 1 for some s, then phi beta of s is going to be smaller than 1 for some beta larger than beta c. Why is it true? Because phi beta of s is defined in terms of correlation in the, si in the graph s, which is finite. So there, the su just the dependency in beta is clearly analytic, in fact. OK? So it's continuous in particular. So if it's strictly smaller than 1 at beta c, it is strictly smaller than 1 for some beta larger than beta c. But this would have been utterly wrong if I would have had this definition in terms of the infinite state. Because the infinite state, there is no reason a priori that there is any continuity there. OK? So there, really, uh, lib improvement of, of the inequality is extremely important. Once you have that, what do you deduce? Well, you deduce that the spin-spin correlations decay exponentially fast. But this, we will see that this is contradictory. This doesn't happen above criticality. Above criticality, in fact, the spin-spin correlations do not decay at all. We will see that they converge to the magnetization squared, in fact. OK, so this, this is a contradiction. So at this stage, we did not really prove this. So it can be a little bit frustrating. But so because this, this will require a little bit more theorems. But what I encourage you to do is simply to check that everything I did here was also working. So with this thing, OK? That this thing is actually decaying exponentially fast as soon as one of the phi p of s is finite. So exo, prove that this is smaller than exponential of minus cn for every n as soon as phi beta of s smaller than 1 for some s. But you see, if this is decaying exponentially fast, then you really prove that the magnetization is 0. OK? So why do I leave it as an exercise? Because in some sense, in order to do that, you need to redo a little bit everything, like the monotonicity in the plus boundary condition, checking that you, can, you have it in the right way. The simon lieb inequality for plus boundary condition, but that requires to use the high temperature expansion for plus boundary condition, and then to redo this proof with plus boundary condition. So if you are able to do this exercise, then that means that you understood this, this whole part of the, of the lectures. OK, so I think it's a good, it's, not, it's small modifications all the time, but I think it's a good sanity check that you understand what is happening. OK, so yeah, sorry. So, let's, so if 
we prove that phi beta of s is larger or equal to 1, then we have exactly that chi of beta is larger or equal to the sum for n of the phi beta of lambda n, and that means that this is infinite. Right? Do you assume somewhere that you have a unique critical point and no other strange criticalities can... So that, that's at this stage, to, in, with this method, yes. You assume... Not with this one. With this one, you, yeah, you really... Whatever you need. Sorry? No, no, but my, my point is that with this one, you can just use a beta C I defined. <laughs> uh, if you want to use this one, you need to prove that the spin-spin correlations here do not go to zero when beta is larger than beta c, and this is not a total triviality. Yeah, so you have to prove something. Three and more dimensions, you can have strange things. Happening. No, not for that. No, no, that, that, uh, no that, that I'm going to answer this uh, in the positive, that it's always true, that this thing, uh, I mean, on ZD. <coughs> you will see what is the important. Exactly, that is not a problem for that. Yeah, yeah. Yes? And, uh, in the proof, you were using uh, the measure of parameter beta, but without saying if it's plus or minus or anything. So, did you use that beta was subcritical? Ah, did, uh, maybe I didn't define the measure without plus boundary condition. That's what you are telling me. And you are right. Um, and this is. <laughs> just uh, yeah, asking, is it the fact that finite susceptibility implies beta subcritical, so we don't care about it? Also? No, I mean, at this stage, uh, just I, uh, I was just not careful, that's all. There is nothing uh, behind it. Uh, I just forgot that I didn't define the state without the plus. So the infinite state without the plus, I'm going to actually define it now in the next uh, lecture, but I mean, which is going to start now. Um, this is just the limit of the states with just finite, uh, I mean, uh, with uh, free boundary conditions. So I just, for, actually, I could also just have defined it. I defined, uh, I defined the thing with the plus boundary condition. If you just take the fact that the monotonicity is true for the free boundary condition as well, it's just taking the limit for the free boundary condition. Is, is the measure that I defined at the very beginning without superscript, and you just take the limit. Okay. I could have done it exactly the same way, right? I mean, that's uh, yeah. just the monotonicity was working the same for this one. I should have mentioned it, and uh, just I forgot. Okay, so that's a good remark. Is that this is the limit when n tends to infinity of this. Okay? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, I think it was on this board I, I, I did take the limit. Just saying that you can, I mean, you know, it's the, every quantity depends on, uh, is just a spin, I mean, depends on two spins, right? It's sigma zero. Spin. So you can take the limit. There is no problem there. Yeah. I for, just for, I don't know why I defined it only for the plus, but you can define it. For what is not clear and what uh, Balin was saying is that it's not clear that this guy has the property that above beta c, which was defined for the plus state, right? It was defined in terms of the magnetization. It's not clear that the spin-spin correlation for this guy above beta c do not decay. Why wouldn't they decay exponentially fast? Maybe they do. And actually, if you think about it on a tree, for instance, they do decay exponentially fast above criticality. So it can happen, but not on ZD. And this is going to be one of the things I'm going to prove in the next lecture. But if you don't like that, you do it with a plus state. And there, it's, you have no assumption. OK. Are there other questions on uh, this part of? Uh, yeah. Um, I guess it's, yeah, because you can just, I mean, you can use the DLR condition and then do it for every one of the thing and average afterwards, I guess.
I should think a little bit more because this gives state sometimes I can, uh, indeed, if you take the brush in or things like that, you can maybe, uh, okay, I will. Uh, I will check. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Well, what you you can get the average on your boundary conditions no, of something, and then. Sorry. Yeah, but you can always write it as a. You know, when you take a Gibbs state, you can just take a box which is large enough and just say, okay, you uh, condition on your boundary condition. Just that then you have a quench formula to, and you need to check that the, the and it, the sorry boundary, if your boundary is mixed plus and minus mixed then your arguments about yeah but if it's plus minus sufficiently far then then you can actually prove that this uh, these states do not go uh, i mean this path do not go too far the way you prove griffith yes. relies on the fact that on the boundary you only, you only have pluses yeah, but what I'm saying is that if it's sufficiently far, I think that you can use continuity. But okay, I mean, anyway, that's indeed, I mean, give states are a wide, you know, we have very little understanding even of what they are in dimension three and more. In dimension two, it's, uh, I can answer to you, it's fine because anyway, they are always convex combination of the plus and minus states, so that's fine. But in higher dimension, you are going to see it's going to be the subject of a whole lecture when you have translation invariant states, then you know what they are. Otherwise, it's, I mean, they can be so wide that indeed probably there is a way of cook, uh, cooking up something that can be uh, troublesome. That's, that's true. OK? OK, so lecture three. So the lecture three is going to be, an, so we saw the low temperature expansion, the high temperature expansion. Now we go to a third representation, a third way of looking at the easing model, which is called the FK easing model. OK. So first definition. And this, I mean, this part of the, the, the class actually is kind of in these lectures. So, <laughs> aha. So nobody took them? <laughs> That's how you rule in the Shire. Okay. Um, well, from page 7 to page 13, for people who have that. Actually, you can recognize the people who have it because they have a smile up to there, while the neighbor is like, ah, I hate this guy. OK, so definition. So the FK easing model is going to be, again, a model of random subgraph. OK. But, um, but in order to, because we are going to manipulate it a little bit more, we are uh, going to have ordering and so on, I want to formalize what I mean by a random sub, uh, by a subgraph of a graph. So if G is a graph VE, then I see omega sub, I mean, then the subgraph omega of G will be seen, in fact, as a function From, zero, from the set of edges to 0, 1. So what I mean by that, I mean that omega will be an, an element of 0, 1 to the e. And in some sense, I see the edges for which omega e is 1 as the edges of my graph. So omega e equal 1 is equivalent to e is an edge of omega. OK, so omega, remember, when we mean subgraph of a graph, we always mean the same set of vertices. So it's just a question of the edges. And for the edges, we will say that omega e is equal to 1 if, the, if it's an edge of, of, uh, of omega. I will sometimes, I guess, 
call it an open edge. But this is just because, I mean, I'm used to percolation. I will try to avoid using it because it's absolutely not necessary for us. OK. Very good. I just realized that I forgot the whole paragraph of my class. But that's fine. <laughs> we'll see if I uh, regret it later on. Uh, OK. So this is the definition of a configuration. So now definition of the random cluster model of the FK easing model. So the FK easing model on G with parameter P. Well, it's given by the probability measure. that I will call phi of p. So phi p of omega, the probability of a certain configuration, is going to be the following. It's going to be p divided by 1 minus p to the number of edges in my graph, which remember I denoted like that, times 2 to the number of clusters in my graph. And I need to renormalize in order to get one. So where k of p, k of omega, is a number of connected components in omega. OK? So I want to attract your attention on one thing that if you ignore this term, here you end up with, the, with uh, which uh, percolation model? You end up with Bernoulli percolation. If you remove this term, this is exactly the distribution for which you pick every edge at random with probability p independently of the other edges, right? Usually, you don't write it like that. You write it as p to the number of open edges, 1 minus p to the number of remaining edges. But the number of remaining edges is the total number minus the number of open edges. So this is just a simpler way of writing it. I mean, it will be more convenient for me. The way here I twist this measure is by adding this 2 to the number of connected components. So that pushes the graph to have fewer components, uh, more components, sorry. So it pushes, in some sense, it pushes the graph to have fewer open edges than for Bernoulli percolation. OK? Good. So that's the first definition. The second one I want to mention is a little bit like for the easing model. I had first the definition of the easing model. Then I defined it with boundary conditions. Here I want a little bit to do the same. So it's going to be the following. Now we are going to say that psi, so a boundary condition is going to be just a, distribu it's just a configuration outside the graph. So a boundary condition. Psi is an element of 0, 1 to the zd minus the edges. So the edges of zd minus the edges of e. OK? So it's a configuration outside. You have your graph G, and you have your configuration outside. I don't know. It looks like that. And now the random cluster, the FK easing model with so definition the so FK easing model with blah blah n boundary 
condition psi, so exactly the same thing as there, is given by the measure phi psi omega. P, uh, actually, I realize that maybe I should put the underlying graph here. Sorry about that. Please add g. So it's exactly the same. Except that here, we are going to count the number of clusters in a different way. K psi of omega is the number of connected components. When you count, omega together with psi. You merge omega with psi and the, you count the number of connected components. So let's be careful. A priori psi could have infinitely many connected components. So when you count those that intersect G. Okay? So the number of connected components intersecting G in uh, Omega union psi. So let me give you examples, maybe. So first example, imagine that psi is equal to zero, meaning it's equal to the constant function equal to zero. So in this case, here, all these orange guys are not there. There is not a single edge outside. Then what is the number of connected components in omega union psi? It's just the number of connected components in omega. So in this case, phi zero g p is in fact what I define as phi g p. It's exactly the same measure. So in this case, we speak of a free boundary condition. Second example is equal psi equal one. This will be the very important example. In this case, you count all the clusters touching the boundary of your graph as one. OK? At least, I should say, when your graph has a connected boundary. OK? So this is going to be called the wired boundary conditions. Remember these two guys because they are the most extreme cases in some sense. It's kind of the fewer help from the outside, you are helped by no edges, and the biggest one, you are helped by all the edges outside. Okay. Just two small remarks, but they will be important on this thing. The first one is that you have um, what we call a domain Markov property, exactly like if you condition on the edges outside, uh, on the sides, on the spins outside the graph, well, the easing, the easing measure inside the graph is given by the easing measure on this graph with the relevant boundary conditions. Here, if you condition on Omega E equal uh, psi E or uh, psi E for every E which is in say edges of the graph minus edges of a subgraph. So let's say H 
is included in G. Then when I look at the measure on H, I exactly get the random the FK easing measure on H with boundary condition given by psi union psi. And this I let you check as an exercise. It's very simple to check. So it's really, really the analog of what we got for uh, the easing model. And connected to that, is going to be an important feature of the, of, of, of the next uh, claims is that if I restrict my graph to really one edge, well, I can compute the probability of being open. And it's equal to what? Sorry? Uh, what do you mean by adding one more boundary condition? So if you, if you have an edge like that, this is the edge. What is the probability that it's open depending on psi? There are two choices. If, let, let me help you. Imagine that the two endpoints are already connected in psi. In this case, what is the probability of being open? When I go to my uh, thing here, the fact that the edge is going to be open or not is not going to change the number of clusters because the number of clusters is already one. So in this case, probability of being open is independent of the number of clusters, so it's p. If x is connected to y in psi, where the edge e is equal to xy. Now, if x is not equal to, I mean, is not connected to y in, uh, in psi, opening the edge is going to change the number of clusters. It's going to make it drop by one. So what is the probability of this guy? I'm, oh, I'm already, sorry? OK, let's make bets. OK, we have 2p over 1 plus p. Uh, 1 plus p or minus p? Plus? No uh, idea. That's not how bets do work. I mean, you have to. <laughs> it's not like I wait for the answer and then. Come <laughs> on. OK, well, uh, we are not going to bet on this because it's going to be a massacre. Um, I was hoping that one of you would give it to me because I'm always confused on what it should be, but I think it's. <laughs> I mean, I think this is equal to that. But. OK. <laughs> it's the number of, right? I mean, it's p times the fact that I have only one cluster. So it's, I mean, p times 2, so it's 2p. And then the partition function is either if I'm close, so if it's 1 minus p, then I have two clusters, so it's 4. And otherwise, if it's p, I have one cluster, it's 2. So the 2 cancel, and normally you should get something like p divided by uh, 2 minus p. The important feature here that I want to, you to remember is that it's really a percolation model which has finite energy in the sense that whatever happens around, I can always have this edge open or closed. There is always a positive probability that it's open and a positive probability that it's closed. OK, this is something that is going to be extremely important for us. OK. So this is the first uh, thing I wanted to say. I mean, that's the definition of our model. What is the connection to the easing model now? And the connection is going to go through a very nice coupling called the Edouard Sokal coupling. So, two. So, 
So how can we get the easing model from this model? So imagine you get omega, a percolation configuration on a graph G. How can you get a spin configuration, so an assignment of plus and minuses to the vertices? Well, one thing that you can do is that, so this is a perco configuration on G. Well, what you can do is you can just decide that each cluster, each connected component of your graph receives a spin. So sample an ID family of plus minus random variables which are indexed by the connected components of your graph. Indexed by the connected components of G. So let's call this thing sigma C for C connected component of not G, sorry, of omega. Okay, so you sample ID random variables indexed by the connected components. And then simply you assign to every vertex well, the spin corresponding to sigma of the connected component it is in. So then set sigma x equals sigma c for every x in c. Okay? So you take your percolation configuration, you pick each one of the connected components. For each one of the connected components, you pick a plus or a minus one independently of everything else. And then you say all the vertices in my connected component receive this spin. So in particular, if you are in the same connected component, you are certain to have the same spin. It's automatic by construction. Okay? Once you are done like that, you went from a percolation configuration to a spin configuration. Well, claim if omega is simple according to phi GP, then sigma is simple according to the easing measure on G with P equal 1 minus E to the minus beta. Uh, beta or two beta? What am I saying? Toc, toc, toc. Two beta. One day I, sp uh, I spent like a week because I was getting a result up to a factor two and that was exactly this two, which I was, I don't know why, I completely forgot about it. And since then I'm completely confused of whether it was a factor two or a factor one half, so I'm always confused with this. Yes? A historical question. So I wonder, wasn't this proposition there in the old paper of Fortin and <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's a very good uh, thing. We discussed that a lot with Michael in particular. It is. It is but for some reason, people call it the Edward Sokal copy. So that's that's right. very unfair. It's, it it was already there in the Fortin Castell. I'm too young to correct, you know, the habits of uh, my community, even when they are wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, I was uh, anyway going to say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it is indeed explicitly uh, uh, stated there, and it's more explicitly stated than in this paper, actually. So that's, uh, that's the irony of the thing. Yes, yes. I completely agree. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's it's on. It's really the connected component of the graph, uh, which has all the vertices by construction. All our subgraphs have all the vertices, so it is a honest connected component. As a, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. It's a good remark to make, actually. Thank you. Okay, so let's try to prove that. Okay, so how do we do that? First, let's just give a name, let's call it P, 
to the coupling between omega and sigma. Okay? And let's look at the probability of omega together with sigma. Right? The pair. What is the probability for this coupling? Yes? How do you sample the plus or minus for the independently of everything else? Bernoulli one half. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So what is the probability of getting omega and sigma? First thing you need to get omega. So this is going to be p divided by 1 minus p to the number of edges in omega, 2 to the number of connected components in omega. Let's here decide, oh, well, let's, let's put it like that. And then I need to get exactly sigma from omega. So in particular, I need to get the right spin for each one of the connected components. And maybe this is not sufficient because maybe sigma is not compatible with omega. Maybe sigma cannot be obtained from omega. So if it can be obtained from omega, then the only thing that I need to do is to sample the right spin for each one of the connected components. And if it cannot, I get 0. So here, I'm going to get a 2 to the minus of k of omega. This is the probability to get exactly the right spin for each one of the connected components times, and this is really something one should not forget, indicate a function that omega is compatible with sigma, where compatible means where omega compatible with sigma means that omega xy equal 1 implies sigma x equals sigma y. Right? This is a way of just stating that the sigma must be constant on every one of the connected components. It's exactly uh, equivalent. OK. Well, now what I want is the probability of sigma, right? So the probability of a configuration sigma is ju just going to be the sum, so 1 over z of gp, times the sum <coughs> for every omega compatible with sigma of this thing. But notice that here, these two terms cancel each other exactly. So you get p over 1 minus p to the omega. OK? So here, there are a bunch, and now I realize that I don't know why I defined it as p over 1 minus p. OK, well, let's put 1 minus p to the number of edges and write sum of omega of p to the number of edges, 1 minus p, like that. OK, let's rewrite it like that. OK. So now here, what are the omega, what are the possibilities? So here I just multiplied and I didn't did do the right thing at all. What is that? You are stuck, you know, in this binary way of seeing mass where minuses are important. <laughs> OK, good. Um, what are the omega here on which I'm summing? Well, there are different types of edges, right? The first edges that are important are edges which are between x and y for which sigma x is not equal to sigma y. This guy, uh, for which sigma x is equal to sigma y, sorry. These guys, they are automatically open. There is no choice, right? And then you have, uh, sorry, what am I doing? No, no, no. What did I do? La? No. Yeah, sorry. If the omega are different, they can't yeah, if they are different, they cannot be. Yeah. The so. omega must be a subset of those edges which are 
have equal sigma. At the Sorry? End. The set of omegas must be subset of those edges where sigma x equals sigma 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, uh, you mean, yeah, that is, that is fine, yes. I mean, I want to define E sigma. Let me see what I want to do. So I did want to define E sigma to the, be the set of x, y for which sigma x is not equal to sigma y. OK? I want to define this. And I want to say that for these guys, omega x, y must be closed automatically. OK? So here, I have this 1 over z of gp, 1 minus p to the e. But here, in this um, simply on eg, e sigma, here I'm necessarily putting 1 minus p. So I get 1 minus p to the e sigma automatically. The edges in these things, they must be closed. And then I get the sum for every omega in 0, 1 to the e minus e of sigma. And for these guys, where the edge can be closed or open, I don't care. Right? So for this guy here, I'm just putting p of omega, 1 minus p, to the e minus eg, e sigma, sorry, minus omega. Right? I just decompose in two like that. What is this sum? Well, this sum is just one. OK? So overall, what I end up with is 1 minus p to the e of sigma divided by z of g p times 1 minus p to the e. This is a constant, and this is what compared to the Hamiltonian of the Ising model. It's 1 minus p is e to the minus 2 beta. So now, 1 minus p to the e of sigma is equal to e to the minus 2 beta e of sigma. But e of sigma is what? It's just, I mean, it's just the number, uh, or let's say rather, h of sigma is the number of edges in my graph minus 2 the number of edges which are disagreeing. Sigma x, sigma y, when I'm summing the sigma x, sigma y, it's like, I mean, if you want 1 minus sigma x, sigma y is either 0 or 2 if you are in E of sigma. So you end up with that. You end up with that. Yes, and therefore, this is equal to E to the beta E. Uh, minus beta h of sigma or something like that. And of course, I'm going to have fed this one. Yeah, OK. So maybe here it's 1 plus. OK. Good. So you end up with that, and you end up there with 1 over z of g bit p. 1 minus p to the e times e to the beta e, and here exponential of minus beta h of sigma. OK? This is a constant. So in particular, the only choice for this big thing is to be what I call z of g beta. I mean, 1 over z of g beta. And I, d I uh, finish the proof. This is exactly the measure of the easing. OK? OK, so this is the Edward Sokal coupling. And notice that 
it has a direct, like it gives you a dictionary if you want between the random, uh, between FK easing and uh, easing model. For instance, if you are interested in the spin-spin correlations, how can you re-express them in terms of the FK easing model? Well, you can say, OK, this is the expectation with respect to my big measure of sigma 0, sigma x. But this I can decompose in two. I can say it's the decomposition indicator function that x is connected to 0 in omega plus the same thing when it's not connected to x in omega. What is this thing equal to? If 0 is connected to x, sigma 0 and sigma x are necessarily equal. So this is always 1. And if 0 is not connected to sigma x, sigma 0 and sigma x are independent random variables. Therefore, this thing is always 0. So this is 0. And here I end up with phi gp of 0 connected to x. More difficult if I look at sigma a beta. This was g beta. How do you express it in terms of the event? I mean, in terms of the FK easing model? Yeah? No. Exactly. So it's phi gp of the event that I will call in the rest of these lectures because it's going to appear later on, fa. And fa is the event that every connected component of omega intersects an even number of guys in my uh, thing. So where fa is the event that every connected component of omega intersects a an even number of times. So I mean, it's not quite being paired. I mean, one has to be careful with the terminology. This is like. Uh, OK, no, that's a bad example, but OK. <laughs> it's not necessarily, I mean, it's, it, it's, you cannot necessarily find disjoint path connecting the different guys. This is not always possible. OK. Um, <coughs> So remember this event and try to convince you of this, uh, this identity. Now, how do you handle plus boundary conditions, for instance? Well, there, you can do it using the wired boundary condition of the random cluster model, of the fk easing model. In the following sense, um, or maybe I should ask it as a question. If I give you the random cluster, the FK easing model with wired boundary condition, do you have an idea how you could construct the easing measure with plus boundary condition out of it? So there is one thing that should change for sure, is that here in the definition that we made for the free boundary condition, the thing is completely spin flip invariant. You can change all the, the spins, nothing changes. And this, we saw it's not the case for the plus boundary condition because we saw that sigma 0 plus was strictly positive. So you need to break the symmetry. Do you have an idea how, I mean, what could be a natural way of breaking the symmetry there? Exactly. You fix the outer cluster to be plus. So 
let me define it in a, in a proper way. It's going to be exactly like the high temperature expansion. So you fix a graph G, subset of ZD, and you define a slightly bigger, you define your random cluster model on a slightly bigger graph, which is G plus the edges exiting from G, exactly like for the high temperature expansion. So you have G, and you have these edges. Of course, with the endpoint associated to it. Okay? So let's define these bigger edges, G bar, uh, the, this bigger graph G bar. And what I'm going to do is I sample phi 1 G bar P. And then I sample the, the plus minus random variable for all the connected components not intersecting the boundary of G bar. And I just fix sigma C equal plus 1 for every, I mean, for the connected component of the boundary. Proposition. So again, here the only difference is that the graph is a little bit bigger and the boundary condition and, and the cluster, touch, the connected component touching the boundary automatically get plus one spin. And the proposition becomes that if omega is sample according to phi g bar one p, then sigma is sample according to the plus state. And this proof, I leave it to you as an exercise, OK? To check whether you understood the first one. It's exactly the same proof, OK? So, sorry? Yes. So in the picture, you, 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 you don't show it, but I think the, the, uh, all these blue edges, they need to be connected somehow. You need to, uh, no? So all these blue edges, I mean, they, in some sense, all the clusters of these different these guys are automatically considered as one by the boundary condition. Yes. So here I'm doing something slightly wrong, but I don't want to go into general notion of, of boundary condition. If there are holes in my graph, I have a problem here. So think of a graph for which the boundary is just connected, but um, connected in the complement. But OK, this is a tiny uh, problem. It's really not something. OK, uh, an application of this is that sigma 0 beta plus is now equal to what if I do the same reasoning? Exactly. So you see here, it's, we are really in the deep, in the core of what we call a graphical representation. We rewrote the spin-spin correlations in terms of connectivity properties of a family of random subgraph. OK, this is really the core of, um, of the thing. I'm very annoyed because I don't want to start the next section. It makes no sense to start it now. <coughs> Maybe we can stop here and enjoy the 10 minutes break before. Uh, because I mean, I'm going to stop in the middle of something which makes no sense, I think. So let's stop here and uh, start tomorrow uh, 9, right? Something like that. And what we are going to do in the, in, the, in the next lecture is we are going to show that the random cluster, I mean, the FK easing model has some monotonicity properties exactly like the easing model had. And we are going to use those to construct infinite volume measures. And then actually from these infinite volume measures, we are going to see that for the random cluster model, 
like uniqueness of these measures or invariance under translation, ergodicity, all of that falls quite naturally. And in particular, one of the properties that Balint uh, outlined I didn't prove, which was this spin-spin correlations not decaying above the critical point, we are going to rewrite them as, in fact, the probability that there are, I mean, we are going to prove that it is true using the fact that when you take an infinite volume version of that, there is a unique infinite cluster almost surely, in fact. When there is an infinite connected component, it's unique. So we are going to have some graphical representation like that interpretation of, of our results. Thank you very much. <laughs>